I have to say this lesson was a real challenge for me. Uh, I'm used to taking scripture and I'm used to taking exegesis from it and teaching, but I'm not used to taking such a short verse <laughs> and teaching for a period of time about it. And so I, when, when Butch first asked me, I thought, what have I gotten myself into, number one, or what's the Lord gotten me into? Um, and then I decided that I would go back and I would watch the first video from two weeks ago that we had from Dr. See if I pronounce his name right, Mazzalongo, is that how you said? Yeah, uh, Mike Mark Mazzalongo, which I had been in here and seen, and then last week I couldn't be in here, so I missed the second video. So I found, found it online, watched the second one, and then started working on the verse. And my normal way to study is to take whatever I'm teaching and break each verse down into what it's actually saying and then go from there. Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what it's actually saying. So where do I go from there? And so I, I will confess to you that I have spent three different days at the library this week where it's quiet, not using the library, having my own computer, but using um, a lot of time to figure out how to teach this lesson. Because one of the concerns to me is the Institute for Creation Research and Dr. Morris are wonderful. Uh, but they are also very scientifically technical in what they say. And the purpose of that particular uh, group is to uh, teach that the world was created by intelligent design and by God himself, as opposed to all of the other thoughts we have in this world about how the world came to be. So when you come from a scientific point, you feel like you're sometimes in a, in a classroom uh, with a professor and you're learning things and you wonder what the test is going to be on what you're supposed to have learned. So you have a sheet and I apologize for the, the smallness of the print, but I was using the church's uh, printer upstairs this morning and I couldn't remember how to make a two-sided copy in its full font. So you got one-sided copy with all of it on there. And we'll get to that sheet in a little bit, but um, this is uh, a way for me to teach what the Lord once taught about Genesis 1-1, the, one, the most important statement that they make at the beginning is that it is the foundational verse of all of Genesis and all of the Bible. Without this verse, the other doesn't stand because this is in the beginning. And so I looked at this third video that he had done, which he, if we watched a video, we'd be watching um, Mike Masolano teaching. Uh, and I got all the way to the end of it, and I decided to start at the back and work toward the front instead of starting at where he started at the front. So I'm going to start with the verse itself uh, and what it says and what it means. Um, when I was a teenager, my dad was a pastor, and he was real big on teaching both Genesis and Revelation. And I can remember sitting as about a 16, 17-year-old thinking, well, I already know God did it, and I don't really care how he did it or how he's going to come back as long as he does. I was, you know, I was 16, I didn't have any sense. So I didn't listen real closely to a lot of what he was teaching. I, went, I just thought it was, he was spending too much time on that stuff and I wanted to get the good part in the middle. Uh, I've grown up a lot since then <laughs> and I have learned how important both Genesis and Revelation are to our faith and what we need to know. But at that point I can remember thinking, boy, he's taking a long time teaching Genesis and he is taking a long time teaching Revelation and I wanna know what happened in Luke. Uh, so I've come to the point where I realize that if we do not study, particularly the beginning, and what the Lord says is going to be the end, uh, we miss so much, and we miss so much of the gospel. So um, I realized a couple of things while I was watching this video. Number one, there's plenty to learn from Genesis 1-1. <laughs> and number two, he's written it also from more of a scientific stance. So I'm going to start, as I said, with the verse itself, and then we'll go from there. But I really appreciated how much he filled that one sentence into quite a lesson. Um, the verse says, everybody knows it, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I found it very interesting that when I have a Bible software program that has, it's got about 12 translations on it, and I can parallel them. So I can compare the verse and all the translations. And with the exception of the message, which I'm not sure is a translation to begin with, uh, almost every one of them is almost word for word the same way it's written in, in every translation. This is one of those rare verses where you don't find 
a different word put in for the Greek and Hebrew or anything else. They all say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I found that really interesting in all of the translations that have come through time that I use anyway. So with my Bible program with that, I started out in, in the beginning. And the question in my mind the first time I started thinking about it for this lesson was, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of what? It says, in the beginning God created, but God doesn't have a beginning. And he doesn't have an end. So in the beginning of what? In the beginning of earth as we know it. In the beginning of, and this is what came to my mind, and I was so pleased to see uh, Mike Mazzolano agree with me. Uh, my first thought that came to my mind was time. In the beginning of time as we know it here on earth. Because the truth of the matter is, in all of eternity, I really think we're the only ones that actually need time, right? God created time in the beginning in order to give us a frame of reference to operate in, in order to uh, learn and study and know. Because think about it, we all need a beginning and an end in our thinking. Our life begins, our life ends, relationships begin, sometimes they end, and it's all related to time. So in the beginning, God created time in the beginning. Um, also, when it says God, the term for God in Hebrew is Elohim, and it gets tongue twisting to explain this, but Elohim in this verse is given as a singular unit, but it is a unit of more than one. Okay, we talk about the Trinity, and that word is not used in the scripture anywhere, but we believe, and the Bible teaches, a triune God. Lord, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So when it is used in this term as Elohim, it is talking about the three-in-one God who's created heaven and the earth. So it's not singular in that it's the Trinity, but it is singular in that God, as the Godhead, created heaven and the earth. Now, that was that a tongue twister? But the idea is that um, when we go to John 1, 1 through 3, what does it say there? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I also found it interesting that in almost all the translations, it has the same word for John 1, 1 as it does in Genesis 1, 1. But what does it say in the beginning was the Word, and what is the Word? Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which means that John 1, 1 is telling us that God Elohim was in the beginning. Not just God the Father, not just the God, not just Jesus, and not just the Holy Spirit, but all three in one. So in the beginning, God, Elohim, created, and then the heavens and the earth. He created, I love the, the idea of created. Uh, he um, gave an, exa an example in his video um, that the word created is never used in reference to human beings. Because God creates man forms and fashions, but only God creates. And one of my examples for this, and Rachel will appreciate this particularly, is in quilting. I always found it interesting. One of my favorite things to do in quilting is to go into a quilt shop. Some of you can't relate to this at all. But I can spend hours putting colors and shapes of the, uh, the sizes of the prints and fabric together to make one quilt. Hours. And I can pick... 12 fabrics to go in a quilt and buy the amount I need for that quilt. And they're all in pretty big pieces, yard, three yards each. And then I go home and cut them all up. Because in order to make the pattern I'm going to make, I can't just sew big pieces of fabric together and make a quilt. I've got to stop, decide what that's going to turn out like in the end, pick all the little pieces, cut them in the shapes they need to be, and then put them back together so that it becomes something of beauty, and it becomes something of purpose, and it becomes something because of the plan. God created the heavens and the, and the earth out of nothing. I form a quilt out of something. So when it says God created the heavens and the earth, it means he took out of nothing and made something. I can't even tell the joke well about Satan and God having a plan about it and him saying he can create just as well as God did. And so uh, Satan picks up a piece of dirt and starts to do something, and God says, Get your own dirt. You know, I, I can't even tell that joke as well as I know it. But the whole point is only God can create something out of nothing. And he created 
the heavens and the earth. I found the next part about the heavens really interesting, according to the video and what Mike was saying. Um, he, when I say heavens, I think of the stars, and the planets, the sky, the clouds, things I can see that have form. But he says that um, in this place, what God is creating is space itself, void of not anything in it. He created the heavens. He created the the box to put mass into. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the plan, the place that he was going to place the stars and the planets and all those things. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he created what he was going to go on in the second and third verses, which I'm not teaching today, uh, the things that go into those. Okay, and then the earth is interesting too because I never thought of this before. When I think about creating the earth, I picture in my mind earth, you know, ground and, and rocks and mountains and trees and whatever, the earth itself as I know it. But in Genesis 1 1, that's not the picture. The earth is simply, um, if you will, the lump of clay that's going to be made into what he's going to create, the mass that's going to be there. So he created the materials to make what he was going to make. Go back to the quilt idea. I've got the material, but I haven't created the quilt yet. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the space to put it all in. He created the earth. He created that mass. And the reason we know that a little bit into the next verse, it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness. It means we didn't have the mountains and the trees and the, all that yet in the first verse. So what God was laying out in Genesis 1-1 was the plan and the beginning stages of what he's going to create when he creates the world. Um, I've got a sense. Another way to express this is that God created the building blocks of the creation, which science says is necessary for meaningful existence. The building blocks were there then. What he was going to build from was there. But when he first created it, he created it out of nothing only him in his creation. He was there before, but the heavens, the earth, the form, the space was not there until Genesis 1-1. So my question in the beginning, what, did, what does that mean in the beginning again? Uh, whose beginning? Our beginning. Earth's beginning. Time and matter and space as we know it. Since we know God is eternal, pre-existent, existing now, and continuing to eternity, this reference is not to God's beginning. I thought of a couple of explanations that Mr. Manzano had, like I said, and I was so pleased when I came to the part where he said one of the things he was creating in the beginning was time, because that's what came to mind for me, and I thought, oh, really? I just may be right about that. I like what that is. Um, the beginning of creation, not just time but the beginning of space and matter. Now he goes on, and that's what you're going to do in your sheets, and he starts out and says he has seven philosophies that are refuted in Genesis 1.1, and what I find interesting is he gives the seven, and then he gives a few more. So he's, he's got a lot of philosophies in there. I thought at first I was telling Butch that I was going to ask him to play that part of the video, but he's going to take a lot more time on the video than I'm going to take going through this, uh, and yet it's, it's very interesting. Um, so, uh, I have a little statement in there at the top of that sheet that says, if a person really believes Genesis 1, he will not find it difficult to believe anything else recorded in the Bible. And I thought about that for a while, because people have a hard time with some other things in the Bible. They have a little problem with the virgin birth. Uh, they have a little problem with uh, some of the miracles that God um, has done. Uh, they have a little problem believing that the, the Bible is true in all it says. They want to believe a lot of its allegories in order to explain away the, the, the truth of the scripture. But if you can believe that in the beginning God created in the heavens and the earth, then you shouldn't have a lot of problem with anything else he decides to do. Okay, because even to the virgin birth, if he could create life, he certainly could create life through virgin birth. That's who God is. So the base of that, I think that's why they're saying the basis of Genesis 1-1 is the basis of the book of Genesis and of the whole Bible. But it's taken on faith, okay? Now, there's a lot of intelligent reasons to believe it, 
but it must be believed on faith. And that's where we're at today with this scripture. So when we get into the philosophies, um, I don't know if you got the workbook I did that goes with these lessons, because I know I was gonna be teaching some of it and I knew I need the book. Um, but if you have the workbook, what I've given you on your little sheet is going to be uh, in the book. But if you didn't, then I've given it to you too. So he starts out and he says, one of the philosophies that is refuted by Genesis 1-1 is atheism. And the way he says it is, atheism says there is no God. It says there isn't a God in the first place. So if Genesis 1-1 says in the beginning God, then what you have is the choice to either believe that the scripture says in the beginning God and he was there, or you make the statement there is no God. And if there's no God, then he couldn't have created anything. So Genesis 1-1 refutes that because it says in the beginning God, and what it says is that God was there in the beginning. And then the second one of those is pantheism. And I have to tell you, I'm sure you're going to go out of here and remember what pantheism, atheism, polytheism are. You're going to know all the definitions and you can argue it in a debate. No, that won't happen. But it does help to know and go through them and see why some people sincerely believe this stuff, okay? This is not like somebody's just out in left field and they believe this. There are people who sincerely believe that there is no God, and they will make the argument for there is no God. But it's kind of hard to do when you look at one leaf. Can you really believe, looking at one leaf, the design of a leaf, the function of a leaf on a tree or a plant, can you really look at it and say that this just happened? It had to have intelligent design, because think of this. Think about all the leaves on one tree. And think about all the one trees in the whole world. Could that really have just happened? It takes, as Josh McDowell says, it takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe the scripture in the first place. Because the Bible is the only thing that actually gives us the case for the beginning of mankind and the end of the, the beginning of the world. So the next one is uh, pantheism, and it says that everything is God. So they, they see God in the trees and the rocks and the rivers and the stars. And um, what they're basically doing is they're deifying nature. They're making nature God. We kind of have a form of that today in some of the stuff that goes on with uh, the green in the world. and our, I believe... We have a responsibility given to us by God to take care of the earth that he formed. It says it very clearly in Genesis, take care of it. You know, do what, what, this is my creation, man, you're to take care of it. But I refuse to worship at the altar of green. And there is a big difference, okay? So we can be green and we can take care of God's earth, but it cannot become our God. It cannot take a bigger level of importance in our life than God himself. And that's kind of what's happening when we see everything is God. And I, I don't, not to step on anybody's toes, because I have a golden retriever I love to death. And, I, and I've had three. And I take very good care of my dog, and I love her, but she's my dog. Any day that I find out that my, do my granddaughter Ruby, who lives in my house, is allergic to the dog, guess which one's going out the door? It isn't going to be Ruby, <laughs> okay? We, we've gone too far, and we've made too much of the things that God does not expect us to put the biggest importance on. And so in pantheism, they just everything's God. But Genesis 1-1 says that God exists separate from his creation. He is not one in the creation. He is God separate from creation. Okay, polytheism says there is a multiplicity of gods, such as the Greeks and Romans believe. Remember, I used to love to study um, mythology. I think the stories in mythology are unbelievably fun to read and see, but they're not true. And they come from this belief in polytheism that there's gods everywhere, and they're doing all these wonderful things. One of my favorites was that um, uh, some guy holding up the world on his shoulders yeah, that, that, yeah, do we need that? Or was it Thor that was the god of war? Uh, some of those were so interesting to me, but they're not God. One of my least favorite was Medusa because she had snakes in her hair. Uh, Genesis 1-1 implies that God created um, the heavens and the earth, and it wasn't done by a multiplicity of God. It was done by one God. Okay, so 
Uh, how would I get to? Polytheism. Materialism says what? What does materialism say? Matter is eternal. It's going to last forever. And it is the only thing that actually exists. It's what you can see and what you can touch. That's all that really exists. So how do you explain love? But you really believe that, just leave something out in your back porch for about a year. And find out what happens to it. That's a, that's a good example. I like it. Exactly. Matter is eternal, the only thing that exists. This is the basis for most of modern thinking. But Genesis 1.1 says that in the beginning was God, and he brought into being creation. It has not always existed, and it is not the only thing that exists. Dualism was interesting to me. Dualism says that there are two powers at work in the universe, God and evil, Genesis 1.1, it says God alone is the power that created the universe. Nothing in Genesis 1.1 mentions evil. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But dualism says they're both, and they're both active and busy. We know Satan is running around like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. We believe it. The scripture tells us that's true. But he didn't create the earth, and he is not the ultimate power over the earth. Humanism teaches man is the ultimate reality, that there is nothing high or nobler than mankind. Boy, that's scary when you look at the news headlines. That's true. We're in bigger trouble than I thought we were in. Um, Genesis 1-1 says God was there before man existed. Okay, before man existed. So if the ultimate reality is God, not man. Man is God's creation. Evolution says that something without life came out of nothing and then developed into something animate or having life. So something came out of nothing. No life brought forth life. That doesn't make sense. And the Big Bang Theory. I, I have to tell you a funny story about me. When I was also, when I was in high school, my I have, I have three older brothers, but the one closest to me in age is about 18 months older than me. And he had a biology teacher in high school that began to teach evolution. And my brother bought into it. And for the next um, 25 years, he went downhill in the way he believed, the choices that he made. He became an alcoholic before he was through. He's been sober now for 38 years. But uh, he just went downhill. And it started with a biology teacher that began to teach evolution, which caused him to question whether anything in the scripture was true. And it just, it knocked the pins out from under him, is basically what it did. So um, it started with the, the theory of evolution, that man came out of something that didn't have life into life. And uh, I have to tell you, my brother is brilliant. He's a clinical psychologist today. Uh, he'll argue the other side of that coin now. <laughs> but at the time, it was awful. It was awful for me and him. So one time, he was required to go to church, whether he believed in it or not, as a teenager. And so our church decided, I don't know whose brilliant idea it was, for he and I to have a debate of evolution versus creation. Well, I'm, I'm 16 at the time. He's 17, maybe 17 and a half. We're having this debate. According to the people in the church, I won. But you got to understand, they came from a very prejudiced viewpoint. If we'd been arguing in front of someone who didn't know or was a skeptic, it might have been a different story. But I remember that time, and I remember trying to explain in my lack of uh, real understanding about Genesis 1-1, trying to explain why I believed that the earth was created through intelligent design by a God, a loving God, who chose to make this world. With him, with all of his real, more than me, scientific information, because he loved me, he forgave me for them declaring I won. I'm not sure he ever agreed with them. But I remember that. And I remember the idea of evolution um, and wanting to believe parts of it. Do you remember that? If you ever taught it in school? In other words, yeah, I believe God created it, but it could have happened over 50 billion years because God can do anything any way he wants to. Well, that's true. But Genesis 1-1 doesn't tell us that, and neither does the rest of Genesis. But at that time, in my young mind, I wanted to find a way to make the two fit together, but they do not fit together. Genesis 1-1 says God created something out of nothing. He created out of his own power this earth. 
He didn't have to have his dirt first. And as Josh McDowell said, it, it takes a lot of faith to believe that more than it does to believe that Genesis 1-1. Then uh, Mr. Uh, Mike goes on with these other philosophies that he, he talks about, and I find these even more interesting because the ones I just listed, uh, you can find throughout history, like I said, in Greek mythology and evolution. You can, they're more commonly, at least in my world, known. But now he gets into some that are a little bit more defined in, in uh, philosophy. One is naturalism, and that is that all is matter. All is matter. But if that's true, then who is God? Because he's not matter, and we know that. Okay? Genesis 1 1 says God is not matter. In the beginning, God created matter. And deism. God is not involved. I, I have a lot of people who've told me that. God is not involved. I, he, he created it because I can't explain any other way that the world could have come about except that through intelligent design, God had to create it. But he's really not involved in our lives. And we all operate on that from a little bit different level sometimes because you got the philosophical idea that he's not involved in our lives. But I also remember a, a woman that lived, lived two doors down from me when Frank and I were uh, in our first house when we were younger and married. And she became a very good friend. And she began to go to church uh, at her church. But someone upset her, and she came to see me. She said, I don't understand this. I was talking to, and it was some guy she knew, and he wanted to go to some sporting event that was in town, but you could say the Super Bowl or something. And he didn't have tickets, and so he was praying that God would give him tickets. But she was upset and came to see me because she said, that's ridiculous. God does not care whether we get tickets to a sporting event or not. And I thought, well, yeah, he does care. And according to his plan, he might even give you the tickets, okay? He does care about those things, but, but he is involved in our lives to, to every level will allow him to be involved in our lives, from, from that very surface tickets to an event, all the way down to every breath that we breathe, he's involved in our lives. So when De um, deism says that he is not involved, it is the exact opposite of how involved he is. God is not a God who created this world and everything in it and then said, now you guys go ahead and do your own thing and I'll just see you. <laughs> that, that just doesn't happen. And I have another quilt story for that one. I uh, used to co-teach for 22 years with Jamie Finley in a, in a uh, class. And she is one of the best I've ever seen at having just these little quips and quotes that really hit you like, man, that's really good. So through the years as we taught, I would write in my Bible whatever she'd said in the, in the covers, and then I'd just put her initials by it. So I decided to make her a quilt. So I took all of those quotes, and I went to a friend of mine. At the time, I didn't have my own embroidery machine. I went to a friend of mine that had one, and I embroidered on pieces of fabric all of those little quotes she'd said through the years. And then I put together, it was called a log cabin, but I put together for a quilt for her. I had so much fun doing it because I was rereading those little things she'd said and doing something for her that was a surprise. But after I gave it to her, I told her one time, I said, you know, I really miss that quilt. I, I spent a long time on this quilt. It meant a lot to me. And, and she's so good. She came back and said, well, you can have visiting rights. So I have visiting rights to the quilt I made for her with the quotes on it. But the point is that... Uh, God is very much involved in our lives. And you could see it in the things she said that touched me in how God works in our lives. And we know he does when we walk with him. It, it's just a falsehood that he's not involved. Genesis 1-1 says that God is directly and personally involved in creation. Okay. And then agnosticism, which is one we've heard before. We cannot know. Uh, and that happens a lot. That happens a lot to our young students, even raised in the church when they go away, because they begin to question, and they need to go through that time. As agonizing as it is, parents, they need to go through that time. But as they're going through it, what they're really saying is, we just don't know. I don't know. How can I know is really the question underneath, I don't know, or we cannot know. How can I know that what the Bible says is true? How can I know that this faith that we have clinged to and that we've raised these children in, how can they know that it's true? Well, the answer is the same it is for all of us. It's a personal relationship 
brought through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, and they do come back to it. Uh, as I said before, I think in here, my oldest son Joshua said one time in tears, after all the pain was gone, after all of the embarrassment was over, there was Jesus, because he's still there when we have a relationship to him. So when you have a philosophy that says, I don't know, Genesis 1-1 answers that question of who created the earth, what he created, where he created it, and when he created it, all in that short little simple sentence. That's just amazing. So I like that. Okay, then how about monism? Genesis without God. Okay, Genesis is true, and the earth was created, and all of these families existed because they have a historical evidence, but God didn't really have anything to do with it. So I guess with that one, you have the Big Bang Theory, and you have life come out of nothing, but then as human history starts that we know about, that part's true. That's a little tough if you don't believe Genesis 1-1 where it says God is the one that did it. Because then you start picking what you want to believe in the scripture and what you don't want to believe. Okay, And if, if you don't believe that it is all true, then it's up to you what's scripture and what's not. And I, I don't know about you, but I just don't have that much ability to be able to divide truth without the scripture being all true to begin with. So monism says Genesis is without God, and they're looking for a theory, a theory that will explain everything without involving God. I don't want God involved in it. I just want to believe the rest of it. And then we get into determinism. It all comes about by fate. History simply is going round and round and repeating itself. Do you remember, I remember in a history class somewhere, junior high or high school, that the history teacher was teaching that history spir spirals down, right? So we need to learn history so that we can keep it from spiraling down. We need to learn from our past mistakes. Well, this is even a step further from that because it just says, it just keeps he repeating itself. It's all done by fate. Fate made it happen. God didn't make it happen. It's just fate. It's the, the way it goes round and round and round. Uh, and Hinduism uses that for their um, reincarnation until you finally get to the point that you've done enough good that you don't have to, I guess, be reincarnated anymore. What I'm wondering is where you go from there. But uh, anyway, the whole idea is that is part of this um, determin determination that comes about. This determinism is that it just comes about by faith. And then there's pragmatism. What works is right. The power of right is in whatever works. Whatever works for you, your truth. Have you heard that? I had an aunt who I loved dearly, but she, she was not always a nice person, but she loved me, so she was nice to me. Uh, I had this aunt, and she used to say, uh, whatever floats your boat that you hear, you know, whatever works, you go ahead and do it. And, and we hear it today, and my truth is my truth, and your truth is your truth, but everybody has a truth, and as long as it works for you, then fine. There's no ultimate truth. There's no standard of truth that we have to come up against. But Genesis 1-1 says uh, there is a truth. And the truth is that God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. Uh, it's also that statement that people would make about whatever. Did you ever hear that? Frank and Christy, when she was a teenager, she was a mess. Uh, she's a great kid, but she was tough. She, she determined to do have her own way. And so he and she would get into a discussion, and she'd throw up her hands and say, whatever. And one Christmas, I had printed two T-shirts, one for him and one for her, that said, whatever. And then they didn't have to say it out loud. They could just look at each other and say, whatever. Uh, that's pragmatism. That's just whatever it is, it is, and there you go. And that doesn't work. It isn't whatever. It's what God's done. And then nihilism, and that was might makes right. And guess where that led to? Nazi Germany. That's where it went to. Only the strong survive. And we are the strong. And we're going to survive at the cost of everyone else. That's nihilism. But God created the heavens and the earth in his plan for man to do well, for man to walk with him and be in relationship with him. So all of those philosophies that, that um, we went through in the video, if you'd seen the video, are there now. Okay, so here we are. We could have had a science class and we could have gone through all this, but I would prefer to talk about what that means to us today.
What does that mean to us today? It's great to hear these things, but you're not going to go out of here and most likely in your whole life, maybe, could, but most of us are never going to have a discussion with someone about nihilism. Most of us are not going to have a discussion about naturalism or deism, or if we do, it won't be in the terms of, oh, that's deism, and that's what they believe, okay? But all these things are floating around out there. All these things are discussions you have with people to one extent or another that are in their background are these different philosophies of life, okay? So what does it mean today? Well, I started out talking to you about my teenage idea about... Um, uh, it didn't really matter as long as God did it. You know, I don't really care how he did it, and I don't really care how he's going to end it as long as he's the one involved. I'll just trust him. But there's more importance to it than that. We need to understand that we have to trust God, and that trust comes and starts with this first verse in Genesis. Uh, I don't think we need it all to spend our whole lives on Genesis 1-1, but we sure need to use it as a foundation for what we believe and what we go through. Um, so you're not going to have that kind of a discussion. So what kind of discussion are you going to have? You're going to have the ones like I was talking about where your, your person that is agnostic, they really don't know, and they're not there trying to argue for argument's sake. They really don't know that there's a God because they've never been presented with the gospel and the scripture and then allowed to think it through. So there's some challenges that you can do for someone who really doesn't know. My oldest brother, I love him dearly. He lives in Alaska, and he's very wise, and he very much uh, shares um, who the Lord is in his life. And one of the ways he does that is that he simply says, I challenge you to go, and he gives them something in the scripture to read. And a lot of the famous one is the book of John. I mean, start with the book of John. But it can be even more than that. It can be, I challenge you to go read Genesis 1-1 and really break it down and see what it's saying, and then read the rest of that chapter and see what the Bible has to say, and then ask yourself, is this less reasonable than these other things out here? Because the scripture speaks for itself. And as they go through and they see, how many times have I seen someone say, I didn't know God was true at all. I have a friend, she lives in London now. She's an attorney. Her husband went to MIT. He works for Deutsche Bank or something. Uh, and, and she's an amazing person. And I met her in a BSF group, but I love her because you know how she became a believer? She was raised Jewish in New York. But her mother had a library, and in the library she had a Bible. And this woman just decided she'd read it through and see what it said. And she became a believer because she read it through. So when someone truly doesn't know what can you use, a lot of prayer, a lot of love and caring, but also a challenge. Go read God's Word. Go read it. And one of the things my brother was telling me last night is a lot of people, he said he was talking to one young man and he challenged him to read something. He said, but it's got all those begats in it. And of course, Larry said, yeah, that's about 16 verses twice in the New Testament. Read the rest of it. Go back to the begats later. But you can, and you can also know Scripture and simply repeat the Scripture. I don't know if, I don't know if I've told you this before, but I worked at State Home and Training School in Colorado before I moved here, and it's an institution for the mentally challenged. And um, I had a bulletin board in my office, so I decided it was the time when Confucius says was out there everywhere, Confucius says this and that. So I just decided to start putting Proverbs up on my bulletin board, a new one every week without the scripture reference. And that way I wouldn't get in trouble for putting a scripture on the bulletin board. And people came from all over the building to see what my new quote was every week, and they didn't even know they were reading scripture. <laughs> It was just there for them to see. So there are some very practical ways uh, that you can talk to people and you can challenge them to really think through their doubts, to really think through what they have to say. And then you're going to meet people. <laughs> I have a cousin. He's not a believer at all. He's, he's, he and I are almost the same age. He lives in California. I love him dearly. He loves me, but he is just so lost. And... Um, so one of my uh, brothers on Facebook put a quote of, um, about my dad, who was minister and was super good at walking in the room and walking up to someone and saying, do you know the Lord? Now, I'm not that bold, but he was. And what's more, he was really effective at it, where somebody 
probably walk away from me. But um, anyway, my, my brother mentioned something about my father, and this cousin came back and said, all I ever knew about Uncle Larry was hellfire and damnation. That was what he quoted. So there are people who are going to just be offended, too, or look for a way to be offended of our faith. But I went back and said, Ted, he did preach about hell. But the reason he taught about it is because he loved you so much, he did not want you to go there. And I actually got an answer back from him that said, Looks like I stepped on some toes. I'm so sorry. I've never heard him apologize in our whole lives before. Uh, so it's not the idea of being confrontational, but it is the idea of knowing that Genesis 1-1 starts out, and that is the foundation for everything, and we can stand on it. We can stand on it in truth. And hopefully kindly, <laughs> hopefully in a way that is winsome, that makes someone want to know who our God is. But what we really need to know is we can stand on it. It is truth, and it is there. So, then the assurance that is true, and yes, even the most reasonable explanation for the existence of man, it lets me know that the Christian faith is not a religion, but a faith in a God who has a plan and provision for mankind. And then when we read scripture like the following, and I'm going to read several, uh, we know it is the truth on which we can stand, and we can find comfort in it, and we can find courage in it, and we can continue on in our life of faith because this very first verse is not just a statement, but it's true. And it answers who our God is. So the first of those is 2 Timothy 2.15. If you are a Southern Baptist raised in Training Union, like I was, this is a verse you will have heard because Training Union on Sunday night was where you learned to stand up in front of people and teach something, and you had parts to memorize. But the verse, the Bible verse for the whole thing was 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can do that. And then these, those verses we can stand on in comfort and grace, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace, my fa I'm reading this for the Amplified, by the way. My favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger, and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glorify Glory in my weaknesses and infirmities, that the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell on me. Because Genesis 1 1 is true, I can stand on that. And I can know that the power of Christ dwells on me. Hebrews 12 1 through 2. Therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to us and entangles us, and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher. The first in Senate, Genesis 1-1, the finisher, Revelation. Bringing it to maturity and perfection, he, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In Isaiah 40, 29 and 31, he gives power to the faint and weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and selected young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect for, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. I think that's the best one of all for me in my age. And run and not be weary and walk and not faint because the God of creation decided in the beginning to create the heavens and the earth. <laughs>